Citizen Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's presentation, More Than a Movement, How Anti-Oppressive Practice Can Impact Our Work. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to the WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Please note that upon joining the webinar, you've been placed on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host who will be able to assist you. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to the Q&A portion of today's presentation by utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. If it isn't visible, click the dialog bubble on the top right toolbar and it should appear. In order to ensure that we're able to answer as many questions as time permits, we are requesting that you send in your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will address them during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Once again, thank you for joining us. I will now pass it along to my colleague, Dr. James Rodriguez, to introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Rodriguez, and I am a senior research scientist at the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research and uh, the Community Technical Assistance Center. Um, in in which the, the is located um i am a um i'm also the director of trauma-informed services um and um i come to this work with over 25 years of experience working in clinical settings with children youth and families um i'm also um a licensed clinical social worker and licensed clinical psychologist in new york state and i uh, continue to work clinically um in a private practice that i have um before i pass it back to um jason i just also want to uh, thank a couple of folks who supported us in doing this work ida ortiz um, who works closely with me and um, our intern angela pang for their contributions to this webinar Great, thank you, Jim. And hi again, everyone. So my name is Jason Jones. I'm a social worker at the McSilver Institute. I've been working with CTAC for about six years now. Uh, most of my work is really geared towards children and families, uh, but I have a really keen interest on anti-oppressive practice, anti-racist practices, and how we can incorporate those into our work. Uh, so I, I wanna thank everyone for joining us, and we are going to get started now. So. The first question that comes up is why anti-oppressive practice and why are we discussing it now? And the simple answer is why not now? I think we live in a time where many of these issues of oppression, of the inequality that folks are experiencing, particularly marginalized communities, is pretty mainstream. It's very hard to turn on the television, it's very hard to read the news or even go on social media without hearing about things like the Black Lives Matter movement or the fight for racial justice without hearing about how poverty impacted marginalized communities, <clears throat> excuse me, are really being, uh, are really being impacted by COVID-19 and the inequality that's within that uh, one example. It's hard not to look at the discrimination that Asians and Asian Americans are experiencing due to the spread of, of COVID-19 as well as examples like family separation at our borders and what's happening there. I think that we're inundated with this information, and one of the simple effects of that is that it's impacting all of our mental health. So I wanna take that idea that it's really mainstream, but also pair it with the notion that people of color and marginalized communities have always been impacted by these issues of oppression. Um, so it's always been important for us to talk about it, and nothing is new there. What's new is that it's become so mainstream that it's become a national conversation. And thus, we should really be looking at these with regards to mental health and behavioral health and how that's impacting not only ourselves, but our participants. And that's going to be the main focus of this presentation. What can we do as individuals and, and as organizations as a whole to, do, to really focus on anti-oppressive practice? <clears throat> so, in terms of our agenda, we're going to go through some basic definitions, lay the foundation for what it means to be anti-oppressive, uh, anti uh, what these practice indicators are. We're actually going to distinguish anti-oppressive practice from other approaches, uh, and we're going to see how that can really be implemented within cases. We're going to end with some tips on really getting started. So, how do you become an anti-oppressive practitioner? And then we're going to do some Q&A. So again, any questions that you do have, please utilize the chat box feature. 
Uh, and just to get us started, we did want to chat um, and have a conversation about what you currently do. So what are some ways that you utilize the principles of anti-oppressive practice in your work currently? We're going to give folks one minute or so to kind of chat in some, some answers, and we're going to read them off and just start the conversation there. Great. So we're getting some really good answers, and a few folks are saying that they utilize power sharing, which we're going to talk about within the presentation, and just allowing for more equity within the room. So thank you for saying that. Another person that says, I use principles of critical race theory in my therapy and research. Excellent. Thank you. Trying to listen to everyone, what everyone has to say, and how certain things make them feel. Exactly. Letting the marginalized lead. That, that is a perfect, a perfect way of, of summarizing that. Helping my clients feel empowered. So I, I want to thank you all for chatting that in. Um, also utilizing intentional self-disclosure, uh, your own politics and biases uh, as a white person or uh, whatever your identities are. Um, and just letting that be within the room and letting folks know that you're comfortable talking about that. And we'll talk a little bit about discussing diversity as well. Uh, and the last one is using racial affinity groups. Perfect. So I think that we have a lot of great experience within um, just within the audience. Uh, and we're going to try to share some of the things that we've done uh, within our individual practice, as well as what the research says about anti-oppressive practice. So thank you all for participating. In Please keep on chatting in throughout the presentation. So what is oppression? When we think of oppression, we know that it operates on three basic levels, which is individual, institutional, and social or cultural. The issue here is that we tend to focus on the individual level, right? It's the individual acts of discrimination. It's the individual um, acts of denying a person or a unit resources. Uh, but oppression also operates on the institutional level, really thinking about harmful policies, practices, and norms within education, healthcare, the legal system, uh, even things such as housing if we're venturing out of mental health. So one example that I often use there is redlining and the fact that entire populations, a race of people, were denied equitable housing simply because of the color of their skin. So that's one good example of institutional oppression. And then there's also social and cult cultural norms, right? So it's when the dominant or advantaged group really gets to say what is normal, right? What are our cultural standards? And thus, if anyone's outside of those groups, they become oppressed and they're not allowed to express themselves in the way that they see fit. So it's important for us to move with that definition where it's not only the individual, but we need to really start looking at our institutions as well as our social and cultural norms. And anti-oppressive practice really moves to looking at those structures and institutions. Uh, it's really thinking about the individual, but also where are they embedded? What cultural institutions, what structures are around them that are impacting them or oppressing them? And the impetus really is on the practitioner uh, to think through issues of power and access to resources, not only within your individual work, but also within your organizations and your community settings. So how are the folks that you're working with, participants, consumers, uh, clients, whatever you call them, whatever they prefer to be called, how are they being impacted by imbalances in power? How are they being denied resources? And how can you mit mitigate the effects of that as an individual? And it's not easy. So we'll be the first to tell you that Anti-oppressive practice requires a mindset shift. So you're moving away from the individual and strictly the symptoms that they're experiencing and really thinking about the social and structural forces that are around them that may be impacting their mental health. And it requires the questioning of the traditional medical model of care, which at sometimes it's really hard for us to do 
based on the protocols within our organization. The medical model often tends to individualize the causes of an, of an illness, right? So it focuses on biomedical approaches ra rather than thinking through alternative ideas for healing. Many times we have participants or clients that come in with a notion, an idea, a cultural explanation for what's happening. Uh, but that's not captured within the DSM-5. It's not captured within our organizational policies and, and many times because we're focusing on the medical model. There's often all, also a over-reliance on medication and limited time and lack of support for non-medical interventions. So anti-oppressive practice is not saying that we're denying the medical model, but we're trying to incorporate it as well as alternative perspectives. It's really looking at the structures that are around individuals and how they may be impacting them, as well as other forces that may be at play. And it's based on these basic premises. So it promotes egalitarianism and power sharing, which we'll discuss more. Um, it's understanding that one's social location informs their relationships, informs your relationships, as well as the behaviors that they're exhibiting uh, and your practices. It's really challenging current social structures and cultural institutions in ways that promote equity and empowerment for the users of services. We wanted to include some very concrete ways to operationalize these principles, right? So when you're working with individuals, when you're working with families, and you're thinking about how do I incorporate power sharing and collaboration into the room, uh, so it really is involving participants in all aspects of care. And that starts with asking questions. Does this make sense for you? How do you feel about this? It's involving communities. So when your organization is developing principles or practices, are community members involved in that? Are they allowed to sit within the room and really share what they think would be useful? It's analyzing even the minute details such as your language. So asking people, would you prefer to be called clients, participants, consumers, partners, or how do you want to be referred within the space? It's saying things such as youth rather than teens or kids, oftentimes when adolescents don't like the term kids. And one good example is even the use of the term illegal immigrants, which is pretty mainstream, um, but has also been found to be quite offensive to folks. And the preference there is to say things such as undocumented. It's also looking at alternative healing perspectives, which I mentioned, not just focusing on the medical model, um, as well as seeking out new information. Uh, education is a big part of this. So really trying to understand how can I improve my services? What else do I need to learn? And that happens both at the individual as well as the uh, organizational level. And then there's a great deal of critical consciousness. Um, so it's con continuous self-analysis thinking through what can I have done better here? How am I promoting um, equity or how am I taking equity out of the room? What's the power imbalance here and how can I actually share power with the folks that I'm working with? So we wanted to also differentiate this from anti-racist practice. The main idea here is that anti-racist practice, and you might hear the terms used uh, interchangeably, but we want to consider anti-oppressive practice as an umbrella term. Anti-racist practice looks at all of these things um, with regards to the principles of AOP, but really focusing on race and how that power imbalance, how that lack of equity really impacts participants. Um, it's a subtle distinction, but it's, it's really important for us to make a note of that. One of the questions that we often do get is, how is this any different from person-centered care, family-driven care, trauma-informed care, or culturally competent care? And the answer that we often give is that they're all quite similar. Many of our trainings really talk about what are the unique perspectives or what are the similarities between all of those that you could really provide uh, the best care for individuals and families. So the similarities include Respect and dignity for all. You'll find that within all of those perspectives. Collaboration, uh, autonomy. So really allowing individual decision-making, asking folks, what do you think we should do here? 
Uh, and then promoting uh, empowerment. So letting them use their voices and not interrupting them when they have an idea or they have a perspective. All of those perspectives, including anti-oppressive oppressive practice have those in common. What's different is that when you're viewing things with the lens of anti-oppressive practice, you are looking at the structures around folks. And we, we couldn't make this point enough that you're really looking at the institutions, how they're impacting individuals and families, and how they may be oppressing them or creating power imbalances. You're also looking at yourself as a practitioner and thinking, what am I doing to perpetuate oppression within this space? It's not enough to say just that we know that we have power within the room. We really need to actively look at the power that we have <clears throat> and ask folks, is this fair to you? Does this make sense? Am I overstepping? So within that, there often are challenges to centering oppression. Oh, and I apologize, Jim. This is something you're, you're taking on. It's okay. Um, thank you, Jason. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, either Jason and I could cover this, but um, so, so what are the challenges? I think Jason, as Jason has already reviewed, you know, what makes anti-oppressive practice difference, different from all those other perspectives and approaches that we, we talked about earlier? And it is about centering oppression. And how do you bring that into the work that you do with folks um, in a way that addresses the power and, um, and oppression and uh, discrimination, racism, all the is isms that are out there. Um, and so, um, so there are challenges to that. Um, and, and the challenges to that um, in our um, encounters with folks are include uh, that, in, that folks from targeted groups may be reluctant to share about discrimination, um, about their experiences with oppression for fear that their provider will not understand. Um, there's also exposure to isms that may not be seen by the participants or providers um, as, as problems related to mental health. Um, they might be seen as social problems that do not necessarily impact mental health. Um, and again, owing back to and going back to what Jason was saying about uh, sort of distinguishing this work um, uh, from the medical model, it is seeing symptoms as related to those uh, cycles of oppression. Um, and then oftentimes providers don't feel that they have the tools to have conversations about diversity, about oppression um, in sessions. Um, there have been some data coming out that over 50% of providers oftentimes don't feel like they are culturally competent um, enough uh, to have these conversations. Um, but the, the issue here is that failure to speak about these issues can lead to ruptures in the relationships, can lead to disengagement. Um, and in many ways, when we look at the uh, use rates, uh, the service use rates of people of color and members of other mar uh, marginalized groups um, in the mental health system, we often see these huge disparities. Um, and we believe strongly that oftentimes those disparities we see are in part due um, to these this, uh, disconnections between providers and the people that they serve. Um, and the bottom line, it is up to the providers, that person with the power to provide the space for discussions about uh, diversity that are uh, specifically related to um, oppression, um, racism, discrimination in society. Voices um, in uh, in her per personal manifesto, and I found it incredibly enlightening. And I share it with you here. We continue to work on um, internally a paper to outline what these mean, but we want to share it here to provide some ideas around what. Um, and how you can integrate um, anti-oppressive practice in detail, how you can in incorporate some of the principles um, that, uh, that Jason just shared with us into um, our individual interactions with clients.
And so uh, voices, um, as you can see here, uh, the V in voices stands for validation. It's an acronym where uh, V stands for validation. Um, e, oh, excuse me, stands for open heartedness. Um, I, identifying the elephant. Uh, C, contemplation. E, empowerment and S, social supports. And I'm going to go through these in turn to talk about not only what can be done in the clinical encounter, but also what needs to be done um, for us as providers um, in order to do the necessary internal work uh, to serve our, our clients um, and the participants in care um, consistent with the principles of antidepressant practice. And so validation, um, starting with validation, I should also note that these principles and these ideas are not necessarily provided in order. They're not necessarily provided as a hierarchy. Um, they're meant to um, sort of give uh, practitioners ideas about the areas that, that need to be worked on uh, to advance anti-oppressive practice. So starting with validation, um, one of the things that we talk about is, is making no assumptions. Um, it's important to explore um, the issues around the client's experiences of oppression, racism, and discrimination in our practice. Um, it does start with recognition of the legacy of racism and oppression on our society. Um, as Jason was talking about, some of the uh, instances like redlining um, and other practices and policies that have been put in place to systematically marginalize uh, people of color for many centuries are critically important, but even before um, our recent sort of going back to the legacy of slavery, um, Native American genocide, um, and many of the other instances in our history that, that certain groups have been targeted. And it's important to understand those because, as Jason mentioned earlier, what we see now when we see family separation at the border, we should understand that as an ongoing legacy of our treatment of immigrants throughout our history, where at times when immigrants are needed in this country, when uh, cheap labor is necessary, we kind of open up the spigot. And then um, when uh, things go difficult in this country, we tend to blame the immigrant for the problems in our society. Um, this, that is just one instance of the long legacy of racism and oppression in our society. So it's really understanding um, uh, the, how um, the work that we do um, is historically situated. Beyond that, though, it's validating the client's experience in the here and now of racism, oppression, um, and discrimination. Um, evoking further explanation of those issues in the work, um, getting more information, listening for the understanding of their thoughts, beliefs, and opinions um, about how these larger oppressive forces in society impact them. And then it also has to do with validating um, ourselves and the clients as well, acknowledging transference and countertransferential issues in the work. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. But these are some specific ways in which we can explore social identities. So this is um, in part pulled from the cultural formulation interview. So one of the things we've tried to do here is not only talk about how these issues play out um, in the clinical work, but integrate into it what we know um, in, um, in mental health treatment um, that and, and uh, many of the resources that are available um, that are already there and uh, can be used to process and talk about these issues. So the cultural formulation interview, I often recommend folks taking a look at that because it offers some um, important guidelines uh, for conducting interviews around helping people understand and get some understanding from folks about how identity focus, um, uh, impacts um, service use, uh, people's beliefs about uh, pro the problems that they have and the help that they can get. So this is one question out of the cultural formulation interview. Um, aspects of a person's background or identity can be very important to know about in our work together. By background or identity, I mean, for example, your race, the communities or groups that you belong to, the languages you speak, where you and your family are from, your gender or sexual orientation, or your faith or religion. Again, with a question like this, in whatever way that you put it, that makes sense for you, it's important to identify and talk about these issues, um, in particular, early in your work. Um, but not stopping there, of course. Is this something, so these are questions that you can follow up with. Is this something you feel comfortable talking about? For you, what are the most important aspects of your background or identity? Has your racial or ethnic identity always been this way, or has it changed or developed over time? Um, what do you think about these issues? 
Um, these, are so, these are questions that allow you to deepen the understanding of individuals re with regards to their socialization experiences as well as, as well as their identity development over time. And then validating also means um, that it's important to understand how this may have affected um, them or how it might affect them in their relationships or in their lives um, moving forward um, and in real time. You've told me a bit about your racial, ethnic, sexual, uh, gender identity. It would be helpful for me to get your sense of how you see these issues uh, contributing to your development over the years, your sense of self, as well as relationships with your family members, friends, and other members of your community. These are all ways in which you can deepen an understanding of how oppression and how race, um, how gender, sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, culture, uh, immigration status, all of these issues have played out in their lives. Again, as you can see by the way these questions are laid out, they're laid out in an open-ended way so that you're not making assumptions about which um, aspects of a person's identity are important to them or salient to them in their lives, simply acknowledging um, that they are critically important in the work and allowing them some space to, uh, to think about these issues and have uh, real conversations about them. Validating also means having conversations about their experiences, again, as we mentioned earlier, with racism and discrimination. Uh, so today you've been talking about your experiences with racism and homophobia at work. Tell me more. Are there other times or areas in your life where you feel this way? To what degree do you see these experiences as contributing to your mental health? Again, especially in the area of behavioral health, understanding and helping people to identify these ways in which this impacts their mental health can deepen the relationship between the provider and the participant in care and help to understand and put in context uh, the difficulties that people face in their lives. So the O in voices stands for open-heartedness. So this really um, addresses the internal work that needs to be done for us as providers. Uh, so in validation, we see that there are ways in which you can process and talk about um, experiences and social identity among uh, the folks that we serve. This is really talking about the internal work that we need to do. So treating res res recipients with compassion, respect, and dignity, right? We talk about those as critical in many approaches, as we mentioned earlier, as Jason mentioned earlier, uh, treating people with respect and dignity is part of person-centered care, recovery-oriented care, trauma-informed care, and on and on. But what does that really mean? Well, in many ways, what we feel it means uh, that doing that internal work, you can't treat people with compassion, respect, and dignity unless you're able to suspend your own judgments. Um, it is about embracing the unfamiliar understanding that the folks that we work with have lives and experiences that are very different from our own, of course. And it's also having empathy for self and others. To be clear, what that means is being compassionate and gentle, and gentle towards our own flaws and courageous to move beyond our comfort zones. Um, what that is, what, what that critically um, entails is being able to identify, yes, we don't know everything about these issues. Um, as we talk about these very complex issues regarding oppression um, and racism, privilege, uh, many of the issues that we talk about with regards to anti oppressive practice, we need to recognize that, that these are, in fact, co uh, complex issues. And we often have to sh show compassion to, towards ourselves, but also that willingness to push ourselves to learn more and understand. Um, it is um, oftentimes overcoming um, it, its uh, sort of willful ignorance. And what I mean by that is understanding and accepting our own ignorance around these issues um, in the larger context, but also with regards to uh, the folks that we serve. And to be clear, what we mean by that is that these strategies for, there are strategies for overcoming bias. So some of you may be replaced, may be, uh, excuse me, aware of these, uh, but these are um, a critically important steps in being able to suspend our own judgments. Accepting and acknowledging our own biases can start with, uh, first, of course, being motivated to make a change, but also doing things that you can take, like taking the implicit attitude test at Project Implicit. Um, this is, um, and you can simply Google Project Implicit and take uh, implicit attitudes test, tests on a variety of topics. 
But the first step is that self-awareness. It's being aware of our own biases and being able to realize that, in fact, our biases are normal. Our biases are part of how we develop, um, are part of the way we are wired. Um, and to not have biases in many ways is to not be human. Does that mean that we accept and condone those biases? Uh, no. But what it means is it starts with uh, a critically, the critically important uh, step of developing self-awareness. And then engaging in critical self-reflection. Uh, when we are aware of those biases, asking ourselves, Two very simple questions. Where did that idea come from? And when did I first have it? So as we mentioned in the first section, exploring our, uh, our client's um, uh, social identity development, this also means identifying and exploring our own identity development. When did you first have these thoughts? When did these thoughts become salient to you or did you first develop these thoughts? We're going to talk a little bit more about other strategies um, that can be used to uh, deepen our understanding of oppression. But very simply, these are uh, sort of strategies for addressing our own biases. And then some replacement strategies. I mentioned in the previous slide replacement strategies. Well, what does that mean? It means seeking out people who don't belong, uh, who, excuse me, belong to groups unlike your own. Um, it is, and this is uh, critically important, many of these suggestions differ depending on whether um, or uh, whether you are a member of, of a targeted group or a member of a marginalized groups, a group. Remember, we also have to keep in mind the notion of intersectionality. So in many ways, we are all in some ways uh, members of both marginalized um, and oppressed groups. Some folks do experience multiple forms of oppression in their lives, um, and some folks less so. Um, it, but these issues are critically important, uh, especially for those in privileged positions. Uh, but seeking out people who don't belong, uh, uh, excuse me, who belong to groups unlike your own. Uh, seeking out alternative media. Um, looking at other forms of media that you are not used to, that are out of the mainstream, that might address the needs and issues of people unlike yourself. Um, and exposing yourself and getting comfortable with, we, with being in the minority. Uh, this is critically important to understand that, again, people from marginalized groups often find themselves um, in mainstream settings where they are the only ones in the group. And then engaging in bibliotherapy. We have a couple of um, resources here where you can read. Uh, so bibliotherapy refers to our ability to sort of read, um, deepen our understanding, educate ourselves, as Jason mentioned earlier, educating ourselves um, and getting a deeper understanding of these issues. So LibGuides from Valdosta University and Empowered Spaces are two websites that you can go to that have a number of resources, books, um, podcasts, um, and other resources that help you to deepen your understanding of the experience of people from marginalized groups. Um, and those uh, will be available in your chat, and you can click on those. And then cultivating open-heartedness um, means perspective-taking, walking in the other shoes with humility. Um, you know, of course, there's a, a large focus now on the notion of cultural humility and developing cultural humility. Um, and part of that work um, is being able to, again, realize and recognize, um, in many ways, our own limitations in fully understanding the experiences of others. It also means engaging in compassionate curiosity, not morbid curiosity. So, again, when we're working with people who are from marginalized groups and we don't share those experiences, um, it is important to sort of deeply and thoroughly understand their history, understand their stories, understand the chapters in their lives that have led them to the point in which they come to see you. Uh, not morbid curiosity, like looking for the train wreck, as we often do as we're driving by and looking for uh, the accidents, uh, helping uh, and, and gaining that thorough understanding not only of the difficulties and challenges they face through their lives, but the joys um, that they faced in their lives as well. Um, and again, these tasks and practices may differ depending on the status, whether you are a member of a privileged group or a subjugated group. And then I, I means identifying the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is oftentimes these issues of diversity that can play themselves out um, in the form of microaggressions when uh, we commit um, unconscious um, or unintentional acts or slights. Uh, folks may be or are probably um, 
familiar with the term microaggressions, but it's important to understand that those can happen at any time in the relationship. So having those uh, uncomfortable conversations in the room, um, what uh, Yalom, Irving Yalom refers, refers to as the here and now self-disclosure, being able to stop and identify ways in which uh, someone may have been offended um, intentionally or unintentionally that opens up the conversations. And these opportunities to discuss the elephant in the room can happen at the beginning of the rate relationship. As I mentioned earlier in validation, ways that you can just bring up the issues from the very beginning. Um, of course, when service recipients bring it up, uh, when people in care bring up those experiences of racism and oppression or exposure to microaggressions, and sometimes we have to be hearing for the ways in which those may have been um, acts of uh, racism and discrimination that sometimes our clients might not even be aware of and pointing those out as well. And then when you've possibly committed a microaggression, those oops and ouches that we sometimes commit um, that we may be aware of um, and sometimes are not. Of course, if we're not aware of it, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but sometimes we are aware of it. We are aware of, aware of ways in which we may have committed a microaggression. And in those instances, it's important to take a step back. So some ways of doing that. Um, uh, these are just some simple scripts. I know that this can sometimes be a difficult topic to discuss, but I was wondering how you feel about working with someone who is from a different background. Um, I ask because this is certainly my uh, is certainly my goal to be as helpful to you as possible. I also know that there may be times when I cannot fully appreciate your experiences. I want you to know that I am always open to talk about these topics. This is some this is one way in which you can address and identify these issues from the beginning um, of the work that you do with folks. Um, and then addressing microaggressions. Um, so these are potential ruptures that um, can impact the working relationship. Um, you can ask or you can say, I am sorry if I offended or made you feel like you weren't understood. As we've discussed before, I want therapy to be a place where you can talk about anything that might be relevant to your life. Can you tell me how um, I have contributed to your feelings this way? Of course, this is in whatever way that you can, and there are different ways in which microaggressions can play out in the relationship. Um, and then are, are there things that I or we can do differently? It's important to note that when you're referring to these uh, microaggressions, to ref avoid referring to your intentions. Again, microaggressions by definitions uh, may not be conscious or intentional, but the effect can oftentimes be, it is the critical piece. Um, and so trying to avoid not taking blame for them um, can often deepen the rupture in the relationship. Um, and then the C stands for contemplation. Um, and in this uh, respect, this is again some of that internal work that we um, have, we talked about earlier that needs to be done by us as providers, but being mindful of power. Uh, contemplation can be seen as synonymous with developing that critical consciousness, uh, that awareness of power and how power plays out in society. So, but of course, power can play out in the relationship that we have with the people that we serve. So being aware of that, understanding that power is inherent in the relationship that we have with the people we serve. Uh, also being aware of your privilege, um, engaging in that critical consciousness that movement and critical consciousness, sort of going back to what Jason talked about earlier in the talk, moving from the individual kind of as the unit of analysis, the focus of treatment, to understanding problems um, as embedded in this larger social, uh, 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 the larger uh, social um, uh, constructs in our society. So engaging in crit critical consciousness means sort of understanding the impact of power. Um, examining and questioning your own beliefs. We kind of addressed that earlier. And then, again, as I mentioned, moving from individual systemic explanations. What that might look like. Um, de developing critical consciousness can oftentimes look like, um, again, explaining things from a systemic rather than an individual or group explanation. Uh, so just to give you a simple example of that, uh, we know right now, for example, that um, that people of color are more likely to be infected and die from COVID-19. Why might that be? Um, 
because there is less access to health insurance in the BIPOC communities. But why does that occur? Because they make too much money um, to apply for Medicaid and employers in these communities don't offer adequate health insurance. Of course, with all of these, there are many different explanations. The, important here, the importance here is, again, understanding the systemic explanations for these, the systemic disparities um, that occur in society that help to explain why these problems occur, as opposed to explaining them uh, by um, identifying individual um, or group level uh, uh, deficits. Um, so, and then to continue because the employers, so, but why does that occur? Because employers uh, want to keep their prices low, but why do they want to keep, because they need to sell a lot to make more money. These are ways in which we can engage in that systemic um, understanding um, and explanations for why problems occur. And then exploring power and privilege within the, um, the relationship uh, with the folks that we serve. Um, today, we've been talking about your sense that many of your coworkers are prejudiced. What has this conversation with me been like for you? What has it been like for you to share experiences of discrimination with a white therapist who hasn't had those kinds of experiences? These are all ways in which you can process um, these relationships um, and these uh, dynamics in the work with your clients. And then um, empowerment. So um, this is a critical issue, and we plan on doing some more work in this area, but empowerment means address addressing internalized oppression. This can often be a major challenge in our work uh, with the people that we serve, but it, uh, addressing internalized oppression. Uh, one of the things that is critically important to understand is um, when we think about oppression and the oppressors, um, once um, internalized oppression is instilled, uh, the oppressor's job is done because they no longer need to oppress those um, uh, who have less power in society. So um, it means addressing internalized oppression. We're going to focus on that for a minute. But it also means recognizing the two experts in the room. There are two people in the room collaborating. And these are, again, consistent with many of those other approaches we talked about earlier, collaborating on all matters, assessment, diagnosis, and treatment, exploring uh, alternative explanations of problems, as well as not only of problems, but also ways of healing and educating. I want to focus on, again, internalized depression because when we think about internalized depression, again, uh, this is basically that in, the, it internalizing the myths and misinformation that society has communicated about groups uh, for many centuries. Um, it operates on, the, on an individual basis uh, when the person believes the stereotypes and misinformation, but it also can um, operate within um, cultural groups, people from the same cultural group hurting and undermining and mistrusting each other. These are all ways in which internalized depression can play out. Um, and an example of that we know in the research, black students who have been at, who were asked to identify themselves by race when taking standardized tests consistently score lower than black students who were not asked to specify their race. We also know from the doll studies that came out in the early in the mid uh, in the mid uh, 20th century in the 1950s um, that um, even young children can internalize racism um, in the doll studies when they compare their attitudes about white and black dolls. Uh, so how do you explore internalized uh, oppression? Um, there are some common influences. Ultimately, it undermines the power of people of color and teaches us to fear our own power and difference. Uh, some common influences include the burden to uh, invalidate negative stereotypes. So oftentimes what we know about stereotype threat, uh, we often uh, see this play out uh, with people of color trying to reduce um, stereotypes. Um, being alone and isolated, the only one in the space, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are just some of the influences that can um, impact internalized depression. There are many others. And some common core beliefs that can, um, that can manifest as a result of internalized depression, common core beliefs such as I'm different, I'm not good enough, I need to be strong, I am vulnerable. All of these are um, ways in which people of color can feel like they just can't be themselves. Exploring internalized depression um, includes, um, again, exploring alternate, um, alternative explanations for people's difficulties and problems. You shared some of your experiences with racism, uh, discrimination, and privilege based on your background. In what ways do you see those impacting the challenges you faced in your life? 
Are there aspects of your background or identity that are causing other concerns for you? These issues need to be explored in depth. And then reinforce that these are things that have happened to you. Um, one of the things that we know in mental health is that oftentimes uh, one of the difficulties that people uh, with mental health challenges face is, again, self-blame. Uh, making sure that they understand that these issues are things that have happened to you, sort of um, unmasking the oppression and discrimination that occurs in a large society. So when we're analyzing internalized oppression, um, also it's critically important not to assume that folks have experienced internalized oppression. Um, so it's, it's critical to um, develop the relationship. The strategies that we've talked about previously leading up to this can be helpful in establishing the importance of these issues and slowly sort of identifying how these issues may play out. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned already, it is, is reinforcing the point that it is not the fault of the people that, that uh, are affected by it, by oppression. Um, and um, but that it can hold people back from thinking well of themselves, from feeling full and, uh, and living full lives and standing up against injustice. And then some strategies, again, providing opportunities for bibliotherapy. Um, when internalized oppression is identified in the work, um, as I mentioned earlier, those, those bibliotherapeutic uh, sources that I gave earlier can also be used to help people deepen their understanding um, of their own um, experience with internalized racism and oppression. Meeting in groups with people who are of similar backgrounds, helping to connect people um, to those groups that can help them connect more to their uh, to their culture, race, ethnicity, um, and um, becoming a close friend or ally. And then lastly, social supports. Um, ultimately, oppression isolates. Um, helping people overcome isolation uh, should be a critical need. And um, as we talked about in internalized oppression, increasing people's connections to a, a corrective therapeutic experience with you, but also corrective cultural experiences with others. And I'm going to turn it back to Jason to talk a little bit about what can be done um, in uh, organizational settings. Perfect. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so as, as Jim mentioned, you know, we went into detail about what you as individuals can do when you're seeing participants, but organizations also play a central role in really adhering to anti-oppressive practices, incorporating the principles within your work. So if we're going through each individual principle, uh, when it comes to uh, power sharing, we discussed it a little bit, but does your organization really have community input or create opportunities for the community to really get involved and be equal stakeholders in the policies that and practices that you're developing. Uh, any kind of mechanism that allows for that will go a long way with regards to participant outcomes, but also engagement. In terms of education, one of the things that we see to be really effective and is also in the literature is constant training and opportunities to really understand what is the role of power, privilege, and oppression within your work. Uh, it, it shouldn't only be on the individual to really take up that task, but if the organization has a mechanism to do staff-wide trainings once or twice a year, um, and it's also important to have these refresher trainings as terminology changes and you learn more the more that you do these things. Uh, there's also structured opportunities for feedback. Right. So not only from participants, but also from you as individual practitioners. So through both mechanisms, can participants and practitioners really allow the organization to critically analyze what they're doing? Can you openly say, you know, I don't think this is working well. I think that we should uh, create this new venture. Um, or is it more closed off and, you know, information is flowing one way? Organizations that really adhere to anti-oppressive practices also look at their policies. Um, and it's not something that happens once, but it's continuous. And really analyzing how are these things impacting participants and how can we involve them within the process? Uh, and lastly, there's always research. So that goes in with education as well, both on the individual as well as organizational level. So constantly updating what you know about anti-oppressive practice, how it's impacting communities, uh, and what you can really implement in a feasible way within your organization. So 
To really end here, we want to talk through some concrete things that you could do to begin uh, anti-oppressive practice and to delve more deeply into this. Um, we do want to say that, you know, just to normalize it, it is quite complex. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's really hard to get started, but some things that folks have done are forming affinity groups. Um, so they're really groups of people that have a common interest. Within your organization, they could just be folks that are interested in anti-oppressive practices. You don't need to have the entire staff, but you could start small and start thinking through what are some of the practices that we could implement? What are some of the policies that we may be able to push our organization to implement as well? Uh, having open dialogue and uh, really the freedom to discuss these things, even if they're not, uh, even if they're not ideas that are taken up by your organization immediately, but really just starting the conversation with a few like-minded colleagues. Engaging in critical self-awareness is of the utmost importance because that's really, and as Jim alluded to, uh, not even alluded, as Jim discussed, it's really looking at your own biases um, as well as how you as an individual is impacting the space that you're in. It's analyzing the power and the privilege that you hold uh, and thinking through how do I share that and how do I empower participants to to gain power and to really use their voice. Um, and then, of course, it's continuous education, which I think can be easily be done. So we shared a number of resources. We're going to we're going to add some resources to the website as well. But that's a really good starting point. Just having a better understanding of what you can do and what anti oppressive practices are. Uh, and ultimately, you control what you can. Right. So we're not saying that everyone that attended this webinar needs to really change their organization, but you have the power within your individual practice to implement some of these ideas. You can share power with your clients. You can always be respectful and, and compassionate, and you can always try to collaborate. One of the things that we did mention is that you have the power to say, I'm open to discussing issues of diversity. I'm open to discussing race and oppression and whatever is impacting the clients. The, oftentimes, your clients will not present that information to you because they're afraid that they might be judged or, you know, you may not understand, but you just saying, I'm open to discussing these things, or this is what I've noticed, I'd love to hear from you, it goes a long way. So with that, we do want to open it up for some Q&A. Uh, I want to thank everyone for submitting questions throughout the presentation. Um, but if you do have some more questions, please continue to submit them. I'm going to start off with those that we've already received. Um, so, Jim, uh, we could both answer this yep. question, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, one, one of our participants asked, uh, what are some strategies for working with clients who express reluctance to discuss oppression or who deny that it's operating in their lives? Um, well, I, I want to know a little bit more about denying that it's operating in their lives, but certainly I think that um, in part um, some of that can be uh, – I often talk about the importance of uh, sharing your perspective and values within the context of the working relationship. Um, and so what that might look like is – opening up a conversation, obviously, um, you know, a lot of what we do is about helping uh, to develop people's meaning making about the problems that they have in their lives and what helps them to overcome those problems. Ultimately, uh, that's a big part of, obviously, of what we do. Um, you can't force, obviously, to them, them to accept that, but you can put it out there in terms of understanding um, your perspective about how these issues play out. Um, and so I, I think about it in many ways, um, like uh, I do a lot of training on motivational interviewing, and in motivational interviewing right now, I, I don't want to equate uh, the problems of oppression with the problems of substance abuse, for example, but there is uh, oftentimes there can be that denial, and of course, just as you wouldn't tell someone uh, who's experienced substance abuse problems um, that um, their, you know, uh, their problems are their own making or that, in fact, uh, you know, your perspective, it is, it is sometimes helpful to share your, ex your perspectives on these issues and allow that to flow. If they don't believe that, of course, you can't, 
um, you can't make them. But um, I'm also a CBT therapist, so I oftentimes like to just engage in Socratic questioning, uh, questioning um, people's experiences um, and engaging them in possibilities about the other discussions and being able to uh, share my observations um, and my connections as they talk about their experiences. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, I think that it's it's a fine line between um, putting your views on a particular client or participant. Um, like Jim is saying, I don't think that you can force them to think any certain way. But I think some psychoeducation is also helpful, um, really laying the groundwork and sharing that you see a connection between these oppressive factors as well as overall health and that it may actually be impacting them. Whether or not they agree is one thing, but I, I think it's okay to put that information out there and see if um, see if it takes hold at all. And, and I wanted to add, Jason, so for me, in my private practice, I, I work with a client who's been exposed or has had um, years of uh, challenges and struggles with anxiety, panic, and uh, depression. And um, our work sort of classically dealt with dealing with and coping with the sy symptoms associated with those disorders. Um, but at one point in our work, he started talking about discrimination um, and microaggressions he'd been exposed to in his place of work. And as we were discussing the impact of that um, and how that may have impacted in a very open-ended way, you know, how do you think that has impacted? It seemed to be the slow progression where he did begin to identify how those did impact um, his mental health. And at one point, I did ask him in a very sort of CBT sort of way, ask him to what degree and to what percentage would he attribute um, those difficulties um, in contributing to his problems. Um, and, and I think it was a surprise to him to say, well, like 50%, which was a big percentage for him, but he started off the discussion by not really recognizing the degree to which that impacted um, his mental health. Um, so these are ways in which you can open up the discussion about internalized depression um, or oppression in general um, that can be done in a very open-ended way. Sure. Uh, another question that came in was really around uh, when you see a participant that's involved in multiple services and those services may actually be oppressing them, uh, how would you support that individual? So in this context, the question is, how would you support a parent who's being marginalized or oppressed uh, by the services that they're engaged in and they're scared of being punished? They're scared of actually saying something and speaking up. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you have thoughts, but I, I want to bring it back to this client that I was just talking about, because when he described to me, so, so I want to go back and, and say, first off, validating those experiences become, this is a perfect example of the importance of validation, right? Recognizing, again, you know, if you, if they are sharing these stories and talking about that, Validating those experiences, of course, and starting off from the from the perspective or the point of view that they exist, and those are very real, very real to their experience. But going back to the the client that I was just talking about, um, as he began to explore how he was going to deal with that, he realized and he actually expressed these very dynamics um, to me. That is, he wants to bring it up. He had seen other people who brought it up in his workplace get fired um, for their views um, and for all. So validating those experiences have to be very, um, have to be a critical part of the work as well, right? Identifying the challenges, right? He was afraid of talking about these issues because he would lose his job and he couldn't lose his job because he has a family to support and on and on. So validating those challenges as well obviously without victim blaming becomes the critical piece and then identifying other ways in which they can do. In the, in the case of this particular client, it also looked like 
obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, he's come to the point where he's like, I need to look for another job. Um, and we also talked about ways in which he can cope with that, uh, those ex that exposure to racism and discrimination in those places. So validation becomes critically important. And then identifying the various ways that folks can cope with that. Um, and in the case of receiving other services, possibly advocating for that person to receive other services or advocating with them um, in, in, uh, in helping them to deal with those settings that, that, uh, where they're getting the services. But um, those are sort of some of the basic ideas. But again, it starts with the validation. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, the slides as well as the recording will be available uh, within a few business days on our CTAC website, ctacny.org. I also want to let you know about a few upcoming events that we have with regards to webinars. So connecting the dots with positive youth development on the 1st of December, uh, bias, equity, and early childhood development, part one and part two during the first two weeks of December as well as structural racism and mental health, uh, where we're going to hear from Dr. Ruth Shim uh, on that topic on December 7th. So please do sign up for those events. Um, we want to thank you all for participating. We also have a online course within our CTAC uh, Self-Learning Center around cultural humility that will be coming up. Uh, so please do look out for the announcement for that at the beginning of December. And uh, as always, please visit our website if you would like to view any past trainings and uh, see any updates uh, as well as additional resources. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.